Welcome to another episode of Living Your Spark Second Half. And I have a great interview with Mary Carol Moore to share with you today. She is so lit up about life. Talk about a great example of a second half sparked soul. She is doing amazing things at 69 years old. And one thing that she just started is getting her pilot's license. And it's something she said she's always wanted to do because her mother was a pilot in World War II. I mean, amazing, right? I didn't even know women actually flew in World War II. It shows you how much I know about history. But yes, and she's just written her latest book. And she's a fairly new book author. She just started writing books. I think she said she went back to school at age 55 to get her Master of Fine Arts in creative writing. So she hasn't been doing this too long because then she had to go through school and she's written three books. She has a Penn Faulkner nominated young adult novel. And then she's written two books and it's a, it's a series. So her, the second one in the series is just getting ready to be public or I mean, she's having her book launch. So whatever that means. So it's already, I guess, published. It's just waiting to be out there for you to buy. But she was earlier in her life, she did something different. And it started out with, she learned Russian and she wanted to be an interpreter. And then it migrated to being a food journalist, column writer, and then cookbook writer. Very, very different, even though she did write, uh, very different than the creative writing, the, the fiction writing that she's doing now. But she's so interesting. She's so sparkly because she's excited about life. And that's what I want for you. That's what I want for everyone. And that is why I introduce you to these people every week. I want you to have an example. I want you to be inspired by how they shifted in their second half. And she also had a very serious medical diagnosis. She was diagnosed with breast cancer and she thought she was going to die. So all of these things caused her to really get in touch with how she was living her life and what hadn't she done that she wanted to do in the time she had left. So it's a great conversation. I loved every minute of it. And I wish she lived closer because she'd somebody she'd be somebody I'd want to hang out with. Who doesn't want to hang out with people who are all lit up about life? So anyways, here is Mary Carol Moore. Today I have a fantastic guest to talk to. Just met her. Mary Carol Moore. Hi, Mary. Hi, Laurie. So we have a few things in common, which we didn't know, but it, I love it when things like this intersect. But one of the things that I wanted to bring her on and why she's a perfect guest is because she is so inspirational with her story and the fact that she started following a lifelong long dream later in life. Mm -hmm. And are you okay? I forgot to ask you if you're okay with saying your age. Yes, I'm 69. Yes. Okay. And so... Yes, later in life. Yeah, and, really later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one of the things you're doing, you're still like, you're just learning. And I think that is keeps our brain so healthy. So just give the audience a quick synopsis of who Mary Carol Moore is. Let's see. I'm a writing teacher and author. And I have a new book that's coming out in about two weeks, A Woman's Guide to Search and Rescue. And it is the culmination of a lifelong dream because my mom was a pilot in World War II. She was one of the women's Air Force service pilots. That's that crazy. Was, I know. What a rare thing. I know. 20,000 of them applied and only a thousand or so got accepted. And she was one of them. And I grew up with this legacy of having a mother who was a pilot, but then gave up flying to raise four kids and work as a secretary at a university all her life. And I was fascinated with her strength and, and purpose. How did she do it? How did she death stick land at LaGuardia with her engine on fire? Those kinds of things are just amazing to me. And wow. she always promised she would teach me how to fly. But with four kids and a job, it didn't happen. 
So at my midlife time, around 55, I decided I have to go back to school, get my fiction MFA, and start to write a novel because what I really want to do is write about my mom, not as a memoir, but as a, a book about women pilots and how women get strength from doing things that are totally outside the box, things that for her generation, being a pilot in the 1940s was just kind of outrageous. And is, your, is she still alive? No, she died. She's, she was 98 when she passed away, um, maybe five years ago. But she, I always, she always promised to take me flying and teach me how to fly. So now at this age, 69, I'm finally getting my pilot's license. I'm finally going back to do all the things that, you know, I grew up with this legacy and I wanted to follow it. And finally, at this point in my life, I have the opening and the willpower. Yes. And that's the first thing we have in common is I got my pilot's license when I was 21. Wow. My that's dad, great. late in life, decided he wanted to be a pilot. And he took flying lessons in his early 50s, might have been around 50, might have been a midlife crisis for him. <laughs> and so I was one of his first students. And I took a semester off college because of a breakup. And it was just this thing that I just wanted to do. I wanted to prove I was in this feeling crappy because of this breakup. And I was like, I'm going to show the world. Yeah, you know, It was just, it gave me something to focus on and gave me a lot of confidence because yeah. it was something not a lot of people do. So That's kudos to you. Well, so, thank I, you. It's scary. Yeah. I tell you, at this age, I think my how is my brain going to work with this? All those dials. The first time I got in this little Cessna and I looked at the dials and I went to the, the instructor said, you sit here, you sit in the pilot seat. And I went, <laughs> you know, yeah, so what you do first these thing. Dials. Yeah. Oh my God, what am I going to do with all those dials? And But getting up there in the air, I, I mean, it was just, so I understood something about my mom that I'd never understood until I did that. Yeah. And now, oh, I now, wish she was alive to see I it. I know. I think she would love that. She so would how many hours do you have? Oh, don't even count. I mean, I'm really, I'm just at the very beginning. Oh, so, so you haven't soloed yet. Oh, that's, do you, they still do this? They cut the back of your shirt when you solo and put your solo date on it. Oh, they used to do that. that. Yeah. They used to do that. Oh. Yeah. So the yeah. other thing that is quite, we're from the same area. I was born in Boston. You and were in Massachusetts. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in New Hampshire. Yeah. Oh, right you're near. in New Hampshire. Okay. Yeah, but about 90 minutes from Boston. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So my aunt got her pilot's license and she was my dad's sister. So she heavily influenced him. We went to visit and oh. we went to see her plane. She got a little plane and she flew out of some, if you said it, I would probably recognize it, some small airport outside of Bill Ricca because she lived in Bill Ricca. Oh, okay. But yeah, so a little that intertwining. So cool. Yeah, from the north. Yeah, the northeast. northeast. I love it up there. So yeah, yeah so explain how you switched because one of the things that you did, which is very brave, is that you had a very successful and lucrative food journalism career. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, because I had a writer on, I have a lot of authors on my program, and uh, so many of them, it's something they want to do and they do later in life. So it's they've switched from some other career. But often I see people who do some kind of journalism work or writing work, but it's not the work they want to do. Yeah. And I think the common person gets confused over, isn't that the same thing? And I know it's not because you went back mm -hmm. and got your Master of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I looked it up because I was like, when I think of that, I think of painters. Oh, yeah. Right. It's in writing. Yeah. They yeah. Have it in dance and theater and fine arts, yeah. like painting. I think food has always attracted me. We, I grew up in a family of foodies. My dad was so into food. We'd had the weirdest food sometimes on the dinner table and we were supposed to eat everything. And so I got ex exposed to good food right away when I was a little kid. And then I lived in France Mm. And it's kind of a given. I studied there. I went to the cooking school there. And I, when I came back, I became a cook at a ranch in Arizona. And the local magazine for that Arizona area wanted me to do a cooking column. So I did. And I wrote my first journalism then. And that ran for years. And then 
I had a cooking school and then I got asked to do cookbooks by a local um, publisher who worked with the California Culinary Academy. And my book won an award, a big award, Julia Child Award. Oh, so cool. I, I, I love she's a very me. late in life inspirational story too. Yeah, this is early. This is when I was in my 20s and 30s. And from there, I went into syndicated. I wrote a syndicated column that was in 86 papers around the country for the mm-hmm. LA Times. So I had this huge career. I was paying really well. And I was writing about a book a year. One cookbook leads to another once you get into that world yeah. and you get known. Yeah, I would imagine the whole creative process is completely different because like a column to me is more like a blog is today, right? Yeah, it's a short, it's 600 words, but within it would be a recipe. So I'd have to create out of nowhere this recipe that had to do with whatever, say I was working a column on pumpkins. So I have to create something unusual that all these papers around the country would appreciate. People in Texas and people in Washington state, and they would all like the recipe. So It's part writing and part actual in the kitchen, working with the food, which I loved. Yeah. Did you go to school to learn journalism? Oh, no. My my master, I got a master's in Russian language. Russian, believe it or not. Interesting. So you're just going to France and then learning cooking there. mm -hmm. So you were actually a cook. So was that, because one of the things that piqued my interest was, In your write-up, you said you followed a lifelong dream to write fiction. Mm -hmm. And I want to know when you first had this dream and why did you not go that way and go the other way? I mean, clearly food was something that you were interested in. And I think we have often, if we're lucky, we have many interests. So it's a matter of picking which one. But I'm just curious because I think a lot of people do have these dreams early on and then they get pulled away for some reason. It's a combination of the conflict in my life between my passions and my sensibility, the common sense side of me. So my passion when I was a young person in college was to study Russian and I got a master's in it and I taught it for a year at university. And then I was going to be an interpreter for the New York City Ballet. I got, I passed the test. I had to take a CIA interview and a, a Russian exam where somebody calls you up on a day that wasn't specified and you just have to start talking with them in Russian. So I passed all this stuff and I got my dream. And then the former Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia. So the U.S. canceled all the trips and I was left with nothing. So then I thought, what else can I do? And that's when I started to realize, oh, I had this background in food and I'd studied cooking and I could build a life around my food work. And so I loved writing always, but it wasn't my first thing. I thought Russian and I thought cooking was it. But it turned out that once I started writing about food, I loved the writing even more than the food part. And I started to dream of, okay, what could I do that's about writing that wasn't about food, not recipe oriented. So I loved cookbooks that were more memoir, like Laurie Colwyn is a writer. She's deceased now, but she wrote beautiful books about the philosophy of food and what the sensuality of it. And I love that kind of lyricism, I guess it was. And that's when I started to realize what I really want to do is write stories. I want to go out of the real world into the unreal world, the fictional world. But the thing that you don't realize, I think I was a professional, well-paid journalist, and I thought I could translate over into fiction. It's another language. So after many years of trying to write stories and trying really running into my own lack of skill, I said, okay, it's time for me to go back to school. So at age 55, I just cut I just decided, okay, I'm not going to, I finished my contract with the cookbook that I was working on. And I decided I'm just going to go back to school and get my MFA and do what I've always wanted to do. Cause that's a midlife. That's the time when a lot of times people look at what they've done and they realize this isn't exactly what I want. Yeah. And that's where I got to. Yeah. So there's a lot of options when it comes to, I think, learning these days. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people, like you said, that you help your writing teacher, like you help people, it sounds like, write books. And 
So what would be, why did you choose the traditional and to go back and get yeah. a certificate? Because I think that's kind of old school now. It is. And not that it's bad, but mm -hmm. you can put the MFA on your thing, but a lot of people don't even care anymore. No, they don't. And you're right. And I, I debated, I, I remember calling around to different um, writers, teachers that I knew, one guy who taught at NYU's MFA program. And he actually said to me, you know, you really don't need to spend the money and do this. You could just hire people and learn on your own. But mm, I, I had a sense in myself that I needed the structure of our program. And I needed somebody to tell me kind of, here's, I wasn't self-guided because I didn't know enough. So yeah, I needed somebody point. to take me through. And I went to that school, the God, I went to Goddard, which is a low residency MFA. And they are, it's a very kind of out of the box school. And it really fit me who I was. I had advisors that took me in completely different directions than my food writing. I had one advisor who was a minimalist and she, she would just X out big swaths of my writing because it was too lyrical, too much setting. She would say enough of this. I but like, isn't that what creative writing yeah, is? It is, yeah. but I had to balance. I had to learn how to balance my tendency to all those years of writing food, how things taste and smell and all the sensual details. And I had to, learn how to balance that and learn how to create good plot and good characters and good structure of my story. And yeah, so I yeah. really, it was a hard lesson, but I just loved getting that in that education. At that I call that, I do that a lot, but it's called over explain, <laughs> over explaining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. What you said something, and I didn't know what that was, low residential low or residency. Uh, what a is lot that? Of the MFA programs now, they ask you to come for 10 days. And then the rest of the time you work from home and you send packets of information or you're writing and you get graded in the mail. Or oh, online. so it's kind of a non-traditional. It's not yeah. like a semester of this no. and a semester of that. So I like that. No, and I, I love that work, it's structured you know? because mm -hmm. a lot of I've signed up for courses and never done them. Yeah. There's still one on my list. I, I, need, I need to get to that. So well, I was paying a lot of money for this. I, I had I was self-supporting. I had divorced at that time and I was living on my own income and I was still doing a little bit of journalism and food writing and editing, but boy, I had to support myself through paying for that cla those classes as I pay yeah. dollars a year, I think, or something like that. Yeah. And that's another question because I always like to ask because a lot of people don't do something because of financial reasons. Mm -hmm. And I always like to know the more of the details around the decision. And so I was curious how if you're leaving a successful job and you're making good money and then you stop that to do something else and go back to school and pay out to do that and you do, and there's no near term financial reward in what you're doing how, what were your circumstances that allowed you to yeah. say i need to do this i'd saved i think my last cookbook paid me like 30,000 36,000 or something like that it took me a year and I banked it and I had money, but it was still very scary. I When I moved back east, which is what I did, I was living in the Midwest and I moved back east, which is where I grew up. And I had family and friends there. And I was joking with one of my friends and said, if you find me in a box on the Bowery in New York City, you'll know that I didn't make it through this new adventure. But luckily, when I moved back to the north Northeast area, I got a job teaching at writing school in New York. So I was able to keep doing my work and I think I did okay. It was a hard first year. I remember fearing that I was crazy to do this. Sometimes when you jump off the cliff, you don't know if you're going to land on anything. And I didn't really know. Yeah, but, but you believed that it would work out. And I think that's what stops a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because you said you listened to your common sense before mm -hmm. when your Russian gig didn't yeah. happen. Yeah. You listened, and that's what we do. We listen, I call it my logic brain. And passion kind of takes a back seat. It's like, uh, I can't do that. And it seems like you hit this point where there were two paths, mm -hmm. common sense, hoard your money, look for another food gig, write another food book, or follow this thing that's been really eating at me. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect 
beating at you. I think also one piece that your listeners might also have experienced is I had a really serious illness around that time. I had breast cancer. Yeah, it was a serious diagnosis. And so I went through the chemo and I went through all of the treatment. And when I came out the other side, I think cancer forces you to look at your life and say, am I doing what I want to do? Because there was a, it was a serious enough diagnosis to where I thought maybe I won't survive this. And if I don't survive it, I have done what I came for and the things I really want to do. And one of them was write the damn book (laughs) and get to know my mom in some way through the story. And so I finally was able to do that. And I am grateful that I was able, that I had the courage. I think the cancer gave me the courage to do that. Yeah, that is a quote that I might put on my social media. (laughs) Yeah. Ask yourself, have you done what I am came, came here to for. do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And not that, everybody has to do that kind of facing the wall with a serious experience to make these kinds of changes. Yeah. I don't believe that, but I did. Yeah. I had to get kicked. Yeah. And I want this to be a message to anyone who is listening. What if you had cancer? What if you got a diagnosis tomorrow? Mm-hmm maybe pretend you do and not to be morbid or anything, but pretend you get this notice and you're lucky that you don't, but pretend you do. And then what is it that you want to shift? Yeah. And all the things that don't matter start to show up. The things that you just put in your time with, you just, I'm sick of smelling like garlic all the time. I'm sick of doing the food writing all the time, but I didn't, I mean, it's paying me well. I don't want to stop it, but I can't get out of that box until this thing happens and shakes me up. And then I can say, oh, what I really want to do. But there's that that gap between what you're leaving and what you're going to. And it's like, you don't know if you're going to make that gap, if you're going to jump that gap. So it's, I had a good support system. I had really close friends and family that kept me going that first year. And yeah, what did you learn by now you're on the other side of that gap? What did it teach you Mm -hmm. that you would like to share? I don't think I could have done this earlier than I did it. I don't think that I would have been better off if I, 10 years before, had moved to fiction writing. I needed to really establish myself and save the money and get myself grounded in something that I was an expert at. And I became an expert at this. I mastered it. And then I felt like I had really good confidence in, in, in my ability to change my life. And so then when I did change my life, I could always look back and say, well, you did this other scary thing. You can do this one too. And the same as I'm facing the flying lessons now, I did this other scary thing. So now I can do the flying lessons. So it's a stepping stone throughout your life. It's not just, you don't just land on one stone and stay there. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Before I move on, because I'm thinking a listener might have this question. When were you making this transition? Did you get the cancer diagnosis? Were you still writing your book? Yeah. Had you finished it? I, I was still in the food writing world and I was I had contracted for another cookbook when I got the diagnosis and I knew I'd have to take a break for chemo and I did. And then I finished, I stayed where I was and I finished my book and I finished every all my obligations and then I moved on. Cause I I'm a I don't know. My grandmother used to call it carrying through somebody that wraps up stuff. I don't like to leave loose ends that I have to go back and fix later. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it a, probably gave you time too to think about yeah, everything. Really, really think the about transition. It. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on. So you have this book that's coming out in two weeks, yeah. which is really exciting. But it sounds like it's a nonfiction. Is no, it a fiction, fiction. based on? Yeah, it's okay. Really, it's but it says a woman's guide. And so a I'm like, oh, guide. do I open this as a book? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> it says a novel at the bottom, but it's about two women pilots. One of them is running away from a murder frame. She's framed for a murder. And the only place she can run is to the family she doesn't know, her strange sister. And so she escapes by stealing a plane and lands in this gorge near her sister. And it's about them coming together in this time of crisis, uh, search and rescue basically inside themselves because they're both missing this part of a family they never knew. And then a search and rescue on the outside as well as she evades this person that is that framed her for the murder that's trying to find her. So Sounds it's a, amazing. It's How'd you a get really this cool idea? Back that... and forth. I went again in my mom trying to understand women pilots. That was the first thing. But I really wanted to write a book about sisters, about how sisters are estranged and how they come together 
what they can do. I mean, how a sister fills a gap in someone's life that no one else can. So. Yeah. I have an estranged sister, my only sibling. Oh, yeah. It's very hard. My sister died. I have two sisters. One of them died. And early on, she was a very troubled, she was an addict, she was a very troubled person. And I loved her. I adored her. I idolized her. And her illness kept everybody apart from her. And there was nothing I could do. I tried very hard to be part of her life. But addiction is a terrible thing. And at the end, when she died, I realized that I wanted to, again, like learning my mom through my writing, I wanted to understand reconciliation with my sister. So I wrote about two women who are sisters who don't know about each other, and then come together in this crisis and actually become what I call found family. So they form a tribe that is not their original family, but something that means a lot to them, saves them. Sounds, sounds wonderful. Oh, I hope you like it. It's And this is the first one? This is the second one. This is okay. the, the sequel to the first one that I wrote after my MFA. Oh, yeah. I love sequels. Oh, so good. we should start well, with the first one, right? Well, the first one is about a, a young girl whose brother is in an accident that she causes and he goes into a coma. Oh. So she's struggling with her family relationship and her feelings of guilt and will her brother survive? And at the same time, she falls in love during that summer. And it's about deserved happiness, whether somebody can actually have happiness when they've caused this kind of misery for others. Oh. And but you said it's a sequel. So it are is. there so characters? Same that... family. Same oh, family. Oh, I yeah. love sequels. <laughs> I know. If you like one book, you'll probably get to read the other. One. Oh, that's great. Okay, Thanks. we'll link it up in the show notes. Okay. So and thinking about a person who's listening, who might be thinking, or inspired by your story, And something's tugging, they know something's been tugging or eating away, as you have said, happened to you. I would put them in this category of, because I think there's three type of people. There's the dreamers, they're always dreaming. And then there's the non-dreamers who don't dream. And I have reasons for that, but we won't go into that now. I was a non-dreamer, I think. But I think they have dreams. They just haven't put the pieces together. And then there's this dream, dreamers, but delayers. Mm -hmm. And you fall into that category. And so you did touch on the fact that part of it is because you think you couldn't have done it sooner. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I love that perspective because I think we come with so much wisdom that we disregard that we have at this age. Yeah. And there's so much that we couldn't have done because we didn't have that then. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious if there's anything else that comes up for you when you think about delaying your dream. Because I mean, people can delay the rest of their life. I I mean, there's people that are listening right now that have a dream and they're choosing to not do it and continue to delay it. So I guess that is the person that I would like you to speak to. I can put it in terms of writing only because I've taught writing for so many decades now. And I have many students that come to me in their later years who are really wanting to write something and they're scared to death and they realize that they think that they have to give up their entire life in order to do this. And so my job as a teacher was to take them into the first baby step. Like what can they do an hour a week that will contribute to their dream that will keep it alive? Because it's like a plant. You have to water it. The dream will sit there and die unless you do something, but you don't have to give your all You don't have to do what I did where you leave your life and start a new life. It can be something small and gradual. And so when I hear about one of these students that's actually published a book, maybe she's 80 and she published her first book and it's like the lifelong dream come true. I know that she's done it. It took her a long time. One of them that just did that took her a long time and she did it step by step, little bit at a time. And then it grew and it became self-sustaining because in the beginning, it's all your energy going into the new dream. There's nothing the dream's giving back to you yet. But if you build the energy into the dream, like I did with my books, then suddenly the book starts giving back to you and it's going to fulfill that, that need, that fuel that you need to keep going. So I'm not there with flying yet. It's I'm giving it all the energy because I don't know enough, but there's going to be a point Like when I was in the plane over Lowell, Mass the other day, and I looked down, I thought, ah, this is it. So more of those moments will start fueling my desire and my momentum. 
And that's how it is with a dream. I think maybe that helps some of the people listening. I don't know. What general aviation place? What is the the little airport you're flying out of? Oh, it's a Nashua airport. It's very small. Nashua. Okay. Yeah, in New Hampshire. I'm trying to think of where my aunt, I can't think of the name of it. She. I think she did. She had a plane wreck. She was a passenger. Okay. And I think that was Hanscom Field. Okay. I'll and have she, to look that yeah, up. Yeah. She had, and that's, that's cool. I think, stopped her from flying, even though she wasn't the pilot. I think it scared her so much that she was oh. like, eh, I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. 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 So that is so cool. I'm so excited for you. And so are you, is this part research? Is it something, a business expense you can write off? It is. Yeah, it's like that retroactive, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think so. If I ever write more pilot stories, I have an idea for another book based on these two women when they, their father kind of abandoned them and he was a pilot. So they might go find him. And then that would include flying. So then I'd have to take that more is, flying lessons, right? Yeah. You could talk about all the instruments and I know. it's a VFR and yeah. I, and yeah, versus IFR, which is instrument rating. I never got my instrument rating. But yeah, my first date with my ex-husband, he picked me up at Dulles Airport because I had a flying lesson. I had a night lesson oh, wow. at Dulles wow. Airport. And that's we weren't flying out of, I mean, I flew out of a smaller airport. But so he picked me up. And I think I always say, I think that's what why he liked about me because I think he, first of all he's fascinated and secondly he was like oh her dad's a pilot I can get my license and yeah. and he ended up getting his license and then we ended up using we we flew for a little bit and then took a hiatus for like 10 years and then he got back into it and got his instrument rating and we bought an airplane and at the wow. time our daughter was in college in Florida so we flew to see her a lot down there and she was playing soccer. So that that made it easier for us. Mm-hmm. We could just like, oh, we'll just get in the plane and go. So it, it, for us, it was more fun. I'm curious what you plan. Like, what do you envision? How you using any, all that? I don't know. I just really, the real impetus, Laurie, was to understand my mom, to understand oh, what it was I like to that. sit in the pilot seat and see those dials and look down at the ground and all the things that she experienced. I really wanted to get ahead of that. So writing my book was a two-part thing. One, to write the story and two, to understand my mom. Yeah. I really never got to know this side of her, even though it was so amazing. It was like, and I'd say to my friends in school, my mom was a pilot. Yeah. And they would go, no, only men are pilots. Yeah. That kind of thing. So. Yeah. And also your age. Nobody, I mean, I would love to know the statistics, but not too many people decide to go get their no. pilot's license when they're your age. At age 69. I know I'm a little nutso, but my instructor said, oh, I have plenty of people who are older. So I thought, okay, he knows best. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. So, yeah. and, and I think some people like they want to do something scary, but they don't. What was the do you remember the decision point where you're like, OK, I'm going to do it. I've thought about it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to pick up the phone. How did you pick the place? How did you just like make that? It's going from thinking to doing. I was sitting on the grass outside our house. We were having a picnic with good friends celebrating that my book was going into pre-orders. And I had a copy of my book. I was passing it around. And one of my friends said, do you fly? And I said, no. And she said, why not? (laughs) And I said, because I've never done it. I've never thought about flying. My mom flew. And she said, I know a pilot. I know a flying instructor. And I know an airport. I'm going to text you. So the next morning, I get this text from her saying, call this man. Here's the where you start. And I was like, okay. So I called and I said, do you have any openings for a new student? And he said, yes, how about next Tuesday? And I said, okay. And I was nervous as a cat. I I remember driving there. It's about half an hour from where I live. And I was just like, oh, I I should do this. So, but I got there. He was very kind. And and we went up in the plane and he took me up for an hour around the outside of the plane to explain everything and how Mm -hmm. to fuel it and what to look for and all the tests, pre-check flight, pre-flight check. So yeah, it was, I got chills. Yeah, that is crazy. Talk about the another. universe dropping really? it right there. Really? I know. And my friend was so pleased because she's a pilot. She's not a pilot, but she's a flying enthusiast. And she said, oh, I can't believe you actually did it. I was just teasing. And I thought, don't tease with me. You know? <laughs> she has a secondary goal. She yeah. wants to be your passenger. She probably does. <laughs> Go on little excursions. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> That's but awesome. I, did. I was so proud of myself that I overcame my initial fear of doing it. And I, it was quite a moment. Yeah. You'll remember that moment for the rest of your life. 
and I'll keep doing it. So I'll yeah. have many moments to remember. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So I have a few questions. Let's just wrap up. So I want to know, and this is for those who are listening, who are scared mm-hmm. to do anything. How does the second half of your life compare to the first? Like if you were to say, I think people get to midlife and they think, oh my gosh, I had such a great life and I can never have that. Yeah. And then that makes them play small the rest of their life because they think the best part is over. So I, I, that's one of the reasons I like to ask this question. Well, I have a lot more wisdom now and understanding of who I am and I'm more comfortable with who I am. So I can make decisions based on that rather than just because it's something to do. And I found that was really important in the post-cancer stage. I had the patience for the first time to actually sit with myself and say, is this something that's coming from really deep inside me? It's not something driven by external demands or social pressure or what somebody would think of me or anything like that. I got to do it from the inside out. And that's what I think the second life, second half of life can do. If you have the patience and time to go inside and actually ask yourself what you really want, then there's the ability to do it in the second. My second half has been incredible so far, and I'm only starting. Yeah, (laughs) part of me thinks that was the universe's way to get you back on track with who you really are. Yeah, That's what it sounds like, that you're finally listening to that inner guidance and you're following your passion and doing what you're meant to do. Therefore, the gift of life is longer. That's right. Because sometimes you get so off track or... You get so busy with what you're accomplishing that you forget. Yeah. 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 W- one question. <laughs> and I think I know the answer. What's the scariest thing you've ever done and why? Oh, flying. <laughs> but actually, my scariest thing had nothing to do with flying. I was living in France and I was, again, I was a Russian student in France, believe it or not. I took classes in French, in Russian, which was wild. But anyway, I was hired to be part of a tour group for high school students in Moscow. And um, I had to take a train by myself. I was um, 19. I had to take a train by myself from Paris to Moscow. And at that time, the Berlin Wall was up. And I had to go through two communist countries. And I was in Poland on the train. And I only had one of the stamps required. I only had the one of the entry stamps required. And the guard was coming down the hall. And the woman next to me, who was Polish, but spoke some English or French, I think maybe. And she said, let me see your passport. And I showed her and she said, you don't have the right stamps. You're going to get detained. And at that time, a communist country was, it was very scary. So she said, I will talk to them and I will get you through. And she did. And the guard let me through. And I got to Moscow and I was a day early and the tour guide didn't know what to do with me. So he put me on a bus with Bulgarian students and I spoke Russian. So I went to the driver and I said, I don't speak Bulgarian. Can you let me off? And I wandered for a whole day by myself in Moscow. And when the tour guides found out, they were aghast because at that time, every American that came to Russia had two KGB officials following them. But I was free for a whole day in Moscow by myself. So that whole process of getting by myself to Moscow to join this tour group was absolutely the scariest thing. But I was 19. I didn't know better. (laughs) And I did it. So that's kind of, I I think that has nothing to do with flying. But in a sense, it was like flying on my own to do something so scary and so adventuresome. Yeah. And I like that point, because I think when you conquer scary things, it gives you confidence to attack the next scary thing. Yeah, I look back and I think, oh, I've done this and this. I can do the next thing. Yeah, of course. Just building that confidence armor. Yeah. So thank you so much. It's been a lovely conversation. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed you. I Your enthusiasm. I, I love talking to people who are sparked. It's probably the best topic I could have ever picked for a podcast because the people I talk to, their energy, I always like get, even if I'm like not really into doing an episode or recording an episode that day, I start. And by the time I'm done, I'm like so lit up from just the guest energy and you offered that to me. So thank, thank you. you. It was mutual. I really enjoyed talking to you. your questions are fabulous. So got me okay. thinking too. Good. Any final quotes or what would you like to say to the person listening? Leave them with? Do it. 
<laughs> go inside, figure out what you really need to do and do it. Yeah. Just freaking do it. Do it because you'll not regret. It's really a beautiful thing to look back and say, oh, I actually did this, the thing I always dreamed to do. Yeah. Mm. Yep. It's not fun sitting in fear no. and in action. Yeah. Much more fun attacking life it is. and seeing what comes of it. It's true. It's an adventure. And if you use Mary as an example, <laughs> yeah, the, really. what do they say? The net will catch you. Yeah. Yes. It and really it'll probably does. bounce you back up, right? It It'll does. be like a trampoline. It is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lori. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the Living Your Spark second half podcast. If you'd like to watch my guest interviews, you can find the video version of this podcast on my Not Your Average Grandma YouTube channel. Also, you can check out what I have going on at the moment by going to my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com or find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you like this episode, please mention it to a friend and don't forget to leave a review so I know the topics you like best and can bring you more of that content in upcoming episodes. Last but not least, remember to always listen to that inner voice that will never steer you wrong and make living from the most sparked place possible your biggest priority. When we do that, we make the world a better place.